to a very special episode of Sales Office Mystified. We're joined by Tom Andrews, and this is the first time we've ever had two individuals from the same company. Of course, we had Kirsty in, I think, our third ever Sales Office Mystified interview. Um, and so now we're bringing Tom into the fold. He only just joined Signal. Um, but does have sales ops experience from the likes of Stack Overflow and Hewlett Packard. So I'm looking forward to diving into those experiences. Tom, welcome to the show. Thank you very much for having me. Um, so first question, as always, how did you manage to get into sales ops? Uh, tell us a bit about your journey. Of course. Um, so. It wasn't completely intentional, but I don't think it ever is. Um, mm -hmm. So my undergrad degree was in computer science, and then my postgrad was in uh, marketing and management. Um, started at HP on their grad scheme as a technology consultant, and very quickly um, the opportunity sort of came up to help the sales managers out with some Excel. Um, and I just got really stuck into the whole commercial side of it instead of sort mm -hmm. of the client side. And then as soon as a sort of permanent role came up, um, to move into sales operations full time, I went for it and then pretty mu much spent the next year doing nothing but sort of forecasting, pipeline, mm -hmm. all that kind of thing um, across a couple of different business units within Hewitt Packard Enterprise. Do you think that's a good way? Like, I love the phrase help sales managers with Excel. Do you think a lot of people get into, into sales ops by doing that? For sure. I think a lot of people start their career as an analyst of some sort. You know, you, you've probably got an ability for data, um, but you're probably also quite communicative and able to take that data, sort of apply context and paint a real picture for people, because I think that's sometimes where it falls down. And then very quickly, I think you start to see like how you can use that data to start, to start affecting the sales process and rebuilding the way things run, making it more efficient, increasing your velocity, and it kind of just naturally builds on that underlying skill set as a bit of an analyst. Mm -hmm. and, and you touched upon something there that we see in a lot of these interviews, which is you, you in sales off, you really need that data analytical side, but then you also really need the soft skills side, right? Um, how did you, like working with salespeople at HP, how did you find the soft skills side of that? Like, were you able to engage with the sales team? I, I assume they're some probably like pretty talented, experienced salespeople at HP. How did you as a grad like go and build the relationships with them? Yeah, so for me, um, very sort of quickly found it relatively easy to get on with them all. Um, they were very talented, as you sort of said. Um, all of them knew exactly what they were doing, which really helped. Um, they also had great insight into what they didn't necessarily know. Um, so it was very easy to sort of figure out like what they needed help with. And as soon as I got some quick wins from that, the relationships grew. And from there, it was relatively easy to um, to sorry, I just saw the chat. Um, it was pretty easy to to build that sort of commercial relationship as well. Um, I think it really is the kind of role where y you do have to build quite a lot of faith and trust in your own skill set because mm -hmm. what you are doing is something that is generally quite alien. But once you're able to make that progress, you very rapidly become a sort of business partner or trusted advisor to the people in your sales team that you support. Um, which actually as a young grad was one of the most inspiring things about the role. I was able to do something that was really strategic. Um, I was able to make quite a big impact, but mm. I was doing it really early on in my career. I mean, just like being able to go in there and because you had your computer science background, you were able to like immediately show your value, right? Because I assume you had like pretty awesome Excel skills. Yeah. Um, and so you would have had all these sales guys coming to you being like, help me with this, help me with this, and you're immediately able to actually help them. And then I'm sure that started to help build the relationship, right? They, they could go to you and you can actually help them, right? And because some, like, as a grad in these companies, sometimes you're pretty useless, right? Because you yeah. have any skills. Um, but yeah, I can see that definitely work. Just, if you can, you might be, your, your video, I think, is currently off, Tom, so if you could turn that on, that would be awesome. Yeah, sure. Yeah. There we go. Um, okay, awesome. So that's how we got into sales ops. And can we just like, from there, we covered like just 
uh, the, the first year or two at HP. Can you just take us through the, the other X amount of years up to joining Signal recently? Yeah, sure. So um, after about two years at Hewitt Packard, maybe a bit longer than that, actually, I moved on to um, Stack Overflow. So a relatively big name in the world, one of the largest um, developer, well, the largest developer forum there is. Um, I'm pretty sure they're in the top 50 most visited websites on the internet. Um, and it was crazy because doing my undergrad in computer science, I used Stack Overflow an awful lot to figure yeah. out how to do programming. Um, they had a role as a sales operations analyst and I kind of wanted to um, move into a much more startup slash mid-sized enterprise instead of the beast that is here at Packard Enterprise, see the other end of the um, sort of size meter. Um, and so moved over there, spent about six months building out um, a few different things. It was very focused on specific projects. So I was building out an integration between Salesforce and DocuSign, uh, deploying an enterprise model, looking at some stuff to do with compensation planning. Um, and then the opportunity came up to work with uh, Raconteur that I recently left. Um, so I'd known my boss at Raconteur for all the years leading up to that. Um, we had a brilliant relationship and he, sort of just said to me one day, like, we need someone to come in who's very digitally savvy, help us figure out what we're offering in the digital space, how we are using marketing automation, how we're using sales technology, and kind of just be able to bring all of that together, um, but also who could sort of drive some strategic change within the company. So that was a huge opportunity then. So I went in, um, and worked with a couple of different people to sort of build the first iteration of the digital products, was doing a lot of go-to-market stuff, a foray into sales enablement, was doing quite a lot of uh, back-end changes in the, in the system and just slowly evolved into a fully-fledged, not just sales operations, also, well, sort of total sales operations, so sales mm -hmm. strategy, planning, uh, sales enablement, all sorts of different things. Um, and then increasingly got involved with customers as a bit of a consultant because Raconteur sells a lot of content marketing. These days to get the ROI from that, you really have to put it to work through marketing automation, which if you know a lot about sales tech, you know a lot about marketing automation generally. Um, and then very recently, um, the opportunity came up to work for Kirsty, and I've known her a while through her meetup group. And oh, really? Yeah, and it was, it's, the kind of role you don't see a ton in my opinion. So it sells operations, but it's very focused on the system side, which is my strong point. So I can learn the rest of it from Kirsty. She can specialize in sort of the, the processes and the overall compensation design, everything like that. And I've got a massive tech stack to optimize and build, um, which is what I find the most fun about the whole mm -hmm. sales operations role. Uh, moving nicely into our second question is, <laughs> The current sales ops tech stack at Signal it may have changed in the past four or so months since we spoke with Kirsty. Yeah, so it's definitely grown. It's quite big. Um, we've got a lot of different uh, technologies within it. And actually, one of the challenges is going to be optimizing the integration between all of them and really getting the data flowing. So our SDRs and our EDRs, so sales development and enterprise development representatives, they all live in outreach. Um, we do all our calls through Natavox. We've got Gong for analysis, and that sort of makes the trifecta of the inputs, as it were. Um, our marketing team live in Pardot. They all feed into Salesforce, which is the sort of brains of the organization. Then we've got Hoopla and Insight Squared that sit on top of it. Um, and then, of course, like LinkedIn Sales Navigator that sort of sits alongside Outreach and um, Salesforce. and. I'm probably forgetting a couple of other mm -hmm. elements of it, but you can see like there's a lot of different things happening and it's brilliant in a way because it's a best of breed tech stack. You know, it's got some of the best providers, the biggest names in each of those different categories, but the real art there is then bringing it all together. You need your data running all the way from the very beginning through to the very end when it's with customer success and customer support then informing your marketing and outreach efforts all over again. And it's sort of that like continuous cycle of data flow through the systems that 
is going to be part of a lot of what I'm doing over the next few months. Um, then beyond that, uh, Signal is currently still on Salesforce Classic. And mm -hmm. in October is when Classic support is being switched off. So we're mm -hmm. also on the, the process of moving over to Lightning, which is my, like, I've done it two times now, moved a company to Lightning. Um, mm -hmm. And it's really fun for me, but a lot of change for the sales team yeah. to get to yeah. grips with. I can tell by the, the pace at which you rattled off the names of all the tools that you you know these and are passionate about these. Like that yeah. was, you dropped about eight names in uh, 15 seconds. Um, so are you then responsible for, like, are you the CRM admin if Salesforce org now yours? Yep. So I'm the sort of product owner for all those different technologies right. um, as well as the admin on all of them. So... Mm basically taken ownership of that whole tech stack um which is very exciting a great opportunity to bring yeah. it all together um but i would say that one of my sort of usps is the market knowledge of the sales technology and the marketing technology like whatever the problem may be i probably know the technology that could help to fix it um and i try to always keep on top of all different tech startups because there's so many these days that are mm. sort of penetrating different uh areas in order to constantly be able to build that like best of breed tech stack because integrating them all might be a bit of a pain but ultimately it is best just to use the best in class products and then build uh, an environment around them that helps them to all work together mm -hmm. will you actually be coding custom integrations yourself yeah, you to an extent. There'll be a certain amount of Apex and API integrations. Um, mm -hmm. We're also looking into a couple of different technologies that could help with that. So Salesforce acquired MuleSoft, I can't remember when, uh, which is brilliant for API integration. So we're investing that as a use case. Um, a lot of them are relatively native integrations. We've been good at picking a tech stack that is built around Salesforce, um, but there will be a certain amount of custom integrations, especially when we get into the automation part. So there's already some very complicated sort of flows going on, some process builders, and there will need to be a lot of Apex triggers as well for where we're putting other stuff in. Um, the automation profile is very impressive, if I do say so myself. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so the structure of the sales ops team now at Signal, uh, so Kirsty, I assume, can now lift herself away from the, the detail of the technology yep. and be more strategic, right? And if yes. it's the two of you at the moment, no, we've actually got a couple of other people. So um, Kirstie's sort of the vision. She does all of the big process stuff, a lot of mm -hmm. the interface with sales management, um, sort of things like setting out the mission as well. Um, I sort of deliver it and own all the systems underneath that. Then we've got a sales researcher who um, does a lot to do with sort of data cleansing, let's call it, um, data mm -hmm. cleanup, who's an intern. Then I've got a gentleman working for me who works on all the systems as well, um, who sort of does a lot of the day-to-day -day administration while I do a lot of the structural and architectural stuff, let's call it. Um, and then we are also currently hiring the sales operation executive to work directly for Kirsty, who's going to be very focused on sort of the BI layer and mm. uh, things like commissions. So a lot more sort of along the side of an analyst kind of role. Um, so yeah. once you've hired this person, and we'll put a link below to the job description. If you <laughs> Brilliant. Um, there'll be five on the team. Yes, and then we've also got um, sort of Kirsty's equivalent in the US, um, so based in New York, which is really important because that's a sort of um, very high growth market for us. And so um, our head of sales ops over in the US does tons of sort of like really remedial, fixy, reactive stuff, as well as a lot of taking what we do in the UK and expanding that process overseas, as well as sort of being an on the ground point of contact because the rest of us are all based out of the UK. Um, and for example, the end of my day isn't the end of their day. So if something goes horribly wrong, then mm. needs to be on the ground. But then that will sort of be a full complement, the six of us. Got it. Uh, and just quickly, supporting how many sales people? Um, we've got approximately 70 to 80 salespeople, I'd say. Um, I know I've got 89 users of Salesforce, but nine of them are in customer support. Some are marketing or integration users. Um, and so, yeah, probably like 70 to 80 in sales. Right. 
Um, let's move on to data quality. So if you are the product owner for Salesforce, how are you currently managing data quality? Luckily, we have a sales researcher. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Um, so we've got a ton of different dashboards. We're building out a couple of different formula fields that look at blanks. So for example, if you define your golden criteria for an account as these 10 data points, how many of them are filled out on average, and then sort of setting a rough percentage of that. Um, so that's sort of the overall how many fields are filled out obviously it doesn't take into account the accuracy there's certain amounts of validation to try and improve the accuracy um, but then we've also got a series of boards that look at data governance and hygiene so are our sales moving through the correct stages in the right ways if they're not are we understanding why and can we figure that out and improve the system the process or enable the the salesperson to better understand what the stages are for and when to be moving them um so we've got some dashboards that i would call like red flags and it's things that are just wrong and need to be fixed which would be fields not filled in or um opportunities that haven't moved for over 100 days things like that then we've got yellow flags which are just sort of like these are talking points as a sales manager i expect you to go and speak to your reps like one-on-one -on -one about this and figure out like if it is okay and then that's fine but it's just all of it is around building the confidence we call this all project confidence um building the confidence in our ability to forecast and have a really solid view of our pipeline because i think one of the failing point sometimes between sales operations and sales management is exactly that issue around data quality and if you're not properly monitoring it if you're not constantly sort of rebuilding confidence and helping all of the sales team to understand where the data fits, fits into your value chain that it is a valuable resource and how it actually impacts future sales then you're not really incentivizing them to do what you ultimately want them to do i'm a big fan of um the metaphor about carrot and stick but we prefer to stick with the the reward methodology where possible for sure um and on that kind of getting buy-in for sale for, from the sales team for new things you're implementing like maybe if you shift to lightning or maybe if you are trying a new data policy initiative what is your like top strategy for getting people to actually want to do the thing that you want them to do a lot of it is building business cases which kersey is amazing at um i I'm also quite evangelistic about a lot of the products that I want. And so a lot of it is taking people on that journey of understanding, like, what is the scenario or the problem, which actually in many cases is what the sales managers will often bring to me. And they'll sort of say, like, this is the challenge we have. It would be great to know how to fix it. Obviously, I will always try to come up with a solution that doesn't involve buying another piece of technology to go into the tech stack. But if ultimately... Mm -hmm. If ultimately you like you really like technology tools, don't you, Tom? I really do. Yeah, yeah. The more the merrier. Um, once they're all integrated, of course. Um, but then there's also that whole thing of like if people do understand the problem and the pain points and you're able to remedy all of them, you're able to walk through the USPs of the provider that you're looking at and really, really get to grips with how exactly they're gonna meet those pain points and you can plan in a very sort of visible way for the integration of that whether it be new tool or new automation or just whatever you're doing, I think it, again, goes back to that whole thing about building credibility and faith. So just like a product development team would, I've got a visible roadmap of what I'm doing in Lightning or what I'm doing with system integrations and modernization. So everyone can sort of know where we're going and when they're going to get the fix to whatever that problem could be. And then if it's bigger things or more exploratory things, then that's something that will naturally be a bit further out, it takes some more research, but then it would be uh, sort of a change management process to bring in. So there'd be a lot of, so with Lightning, for example, we've got a Lightning Champions program. So for people who want to be early adopters, who want to get to grips with Lightning, maybe before the sort of general sales team, they're involved in that. They're going to become my internal evangelist. They're going to sort of help with getting the whole sales teams buy-in and sort of use that peer-to-peer, -peer, that word of mouth, that tips and tricks kind of approach, where if your top sales people are using a new function and everyone knows they're a top seller and they say, oh, actually, it's because I use this bit. It's really useful. It's kind of like, again, that whole mental uh, methodology around the carrot like you're showing people the reward they get for using the thing you want them to and so that's my whole sort of go to market with my changes
Got it. Uh, we do we do have a question here. Um, how do you approach the process of filtering leads from marketing to sales? A very good question for Tom. A very good question. Um, it's not the world's easiest thing to do. It does require essentially an elevation of what we've historically called sales operations to revenue operations, which mm -hmm. is that wonderful new sort of buzzword. Um, I do look after Pardot as well as Salesforce. And increasingly, we are sort of seeing the integration between our demand generation tools with our sort of system of record for sales. So all of it is about building a cohesive, visible, and very easy to understand process where you can see the marketing needs coming in through the campaigns, which you can build in any piece of marketing automation software, and then filtering that through your lead assignment rules and then handing them off to reps. But doing all of that with as much transparency about what's happened as possible. So in Salesforce, there's a really cool widget called engagement history, where you can actually see every single activity marketing has done and how it's been engaged with by the prospect for the salesperson. So then they can pay a picture of okay so this person received this email went to this webinar got this follow-up I know roughly why they're being handed to me as a lead there's also things you can do around lead grading and lead scoring where you can show sort of the quality of the company and how it meets all the criteria of your organization's uh, gold account and also then scoring looks at their engagement so a lot of modern methods of lead generation will be able to show you cumulatively why someone is warming up as a lead and then trigger them being passed over. And then through enablement and coaching and training, you can help your reps to understand, okay, this score means they've done X, Y, Z. This grade means they meet this part of our criteria. So overall, the reason they are my lead is this. Um, often the hardest part though, isn't actually building the system integration, it's agreeing that lead flow process. So it's understanding how things are being fed in from marketing and how they're moving across. It's understanding your sort of lead assignment rules. Do you have one SDR who gets all the leads and then bats them off to the rest of the team? Do you do it based on territory management? Do you do it based on industry or vertical? Um, and then from there, building out that sort of very real-time enablement to help people understand why they're being handed over. That's often something that's missed. And I hear sort of complaints all the time, like, oh, I've got a lead and I don't understand it. And that's where it's all up to the sort of sales enablement process to bring together what marketing has learned through their whole journey of you know warming up that prospect to the other side of it where sales is ultimately then trying to engage them in a profitable conversation and it really as with all things it all comes down to really understanding the context the, i've just seen a follow-up from zach so what are the best practices of implementing these methodologies um so generally, I'd say best practices are building all of your rules in your marketing automation in order to be able to do scoring and grading um, and starting from the governance. So starting from having a meeting with your SDR manager and your demand generation manager or whatever you call them and sort of agreeing that lead flow process. Once you've got that, best practices in the system are relatively easy if you've got two tools that naturally integrate and pretty much all of the big marketing automation tools will integrate very well with all of the big crms because they all know they're two sides of a coin mm -hmm. um okay i hope that that answered your question uh moving on to onboarding of salespeople, do you have a structured process in place at the moment we do, that I know of, as far as I know of. Um, but it's something that we're working on quite heavily to standardize, especially between the UK and the US. Um, and then to also build KPI, KPIs around for ourselves, especially around ramp. Um, we've also realized quite recently through some of my initial work in auditing the way our systems work, that the processes and the systems don't naturally reinforce what we teach in onboarding. And that's quite a destructive sort of um, behavior of the system because the system needs to work exactly the way someone's been trained for it to work. So it's constantly reinforcing. Um, 
so for our onboarding process there's sort of like a company layer of onboarding which familiarizes people with the product the technology all the different departments blah 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 what you'd expect at a new company there's a lot of sales coaching sort of going through the go to market going through the sales proposition but at the moment it's not as formalized as i would probably like um at hp when i was there it was an extremely formalized process um, with an entire academy that was called sales school and you whether you were an internal sort of move going from a non-sales department into a sales role or you were coming in as a salesperson you would go through the sales school process and that was very comprehensive role plays that would go through a huge amount of iterations of different customer environments that where you'd sort of be told okay this is the product line you'll need to sell in this go do the research on that and then the role plays would sort of be the check to see if you'd really learned about the product it's um usps where it needs to go and then the system was quite good at, at reinforcing that so when you were putting in your qualification um criteria when you were moving through the opportunity stages it was constantly checking back to the same things you had to discover in that sort of uh, role play process you went through before and then the sales process that you went through would almost be scored the way the onboarding was by the system so it was really really good um and that's the kind of thing i'd like to move us towards by degrees to take some of that corporate process and bring it to signal. Yes. Um, can we talk about productivity of sales team? Is there anything that you guys are doing at the moment to make the reps more productive? Yeah, um, and I think this is where actually it, it does heavily leverage having a very competent sort of systems focused sales operations professional because generally what makes people unproductive is admin and it is the systems like there's that stat that everyone throws around that sells people actually only spend 30 percent of their time selling and a lot of that is because they're working in systems that aren't operationalized and optimized for the way they should be working and so an example would be booking a discovery call there's often loads of different hoops to jump through but is there a single screen that loads when you hit the button book a discovery call that walks you through everything you need to know in one go and then instantly like puts it in all the right places um so a huge amount of what we're doing to improve productivity at the moment is shifting from having like random validation rules firing off when you try and move stage to having everything be almost like a wizard if you remember the old school setup wizards of in microsoft mm -hmm. office days so when you're moving stage or you're handing over from an sdr lead to being one of our um sales accepted leads all of these things are immortalized in these little wizards that show you exactly the fields you need to walk through with a lot of guidance put in so you really understand why um and so while that sounds like it's making them put in more at once actually all it's doing is taking disparate spread out fields disparate spread out data putting it all in one place um, it's also like quick tricks like you can integrate sales navigator into most modern crms really really effectively and then if you set up your data rules correctly what will happen is when you go on a contact record in your crm you'll actually also see their sales navigator details right there and it it sounds so minor, but just the amount of time most salespeople spend switching from their system of record to Sales Navigator to their email back, like that can waste seconds and therefore minutes throughout the day. And then across a team of 80 something like we've got, um, across the 260 odd working days in the year, suddenly you can save weeks of working time across your sales team just by reducing the amount of alt tabbing that they're doing. Um, I think a lot of people focus on these really, really macro goals to improve productivity, but I think actually you should just be focusing on shaving off every single second you can by just streamlining as many of your processes, automating everything humanly possible. Um, but making sure you're doing it in a non-disruptive manner. Obviously, the problem with some automation is it confuses everyone. So you do have to be very mindful of the way the system works currently and then what you're moving towards. Awesome. And then KPIs currently tracking. So we look at 
sort of the standard KPIs, let's call them. So like win rate, cycle time, everything like that. Um, at the moment, we're doing a project to establish all the baselines of those. So we can actually look at when we migrate to Lightning, how that's been improved. Um, fingers crossed it is improved. Um, and we're also doing more and more investigation into sales velocity as like a macro term um, because it's one that I've always really stuck with but for me like all the KPIs need to roll up into something very realistic um, I think often you end up with all these random numbers that are quite small in effect but if you don't know how they will roll up into ultimately like your predictable revenue that becomes a bit of an issue uh, we're doing quite a lot at the moment to formalize is the wrong word but to tighten up how we're doing forecasting so to do with like our commit best case uh statuses everything around that working out the amount of things in commit that ultimately do end up uh closing and trying to fine tune that on a rep by rep level so understanding like do they just not understand what commit is do they understand it and use it incorrectly are they sort of like over optimistic on their deals? And then how can we improve that to use that as a KPI? So we've got the KPIs on performance, but then we've also got it on accuracy because we're really starting to try and become much, much more predictable and much more consistent in what we're doing. Got it. Um, and then a final question, who has taught you what you know in sales ops? Who's been your biggest inspiration? Um, there's actually two people. So when I was at HP, I worked for a gentleman called Rick and Kamar, who now works for Amazon. Um, and he was pretty much the first person I'd ever worked for in a sort of sales strategy and planning role, which is what HP calls sales ops. Um, and he had a huge, like, what I would refer to as enterprise grade view of sales operations and really understood like the massive concepts that are still alien to most companies, like being able to calculate your total addressable market, your serviceable addressable market, your share of wallet, but do all of that in like really obvious ways and relate it all back to your market share and then bring all that all the way down to your win rate and everything like that, like really macro view of it all. And then um, I also work for a, gentleman called uh, Rob Dandorf at Stack Overflow. He's now with a company called Behavox. Um, and he was just so like passionate, enthusiastic, energetic all the time about everything to do with sales operations and had this like deep analytical view that I think you really develop in SaaS because SaaS is built all around these like a hundred odd KPIs and different terms and really helped me to move from hardware to software because it's a huge transition going from a Leviathan like HP um, to a company like Stack Overflow, which has seen tremendous growth, but tracks a myriad of metrics that you can only really look at in SaaS when you've got subscription models and you've got all of these things like um, annualized revenue, annual recurring revenue, monthly risk recurring revenue, uplift, ramp, all these different things in your clients that you don't necessarily need to think about when you're doing one one off sales. Um, so it would be those two. Awesome. Well, let me share a couple of things. I've got like six different points here. Um, my, I think the biggest highlight or the thing that we haven't heard before is when trying to improve productivity, don't necessarily focus on these big massive rocks, but try and shave off tiny parts through automation or through streamlining. Um, the point right at the start is how you own sales operations by helping sales managers with Excel. <laughs> that, that kind of makes sense. Um, we didn't really touch on this, but the continuous cycle of data flow throughout from marketing to sales to customer success and then back into reinform marketing, I think was super interesting. Um, carrot, not the stick when trying to incentivize <laughs> salespeople. And then, yeah, this is a big thing, actually, how, how you guys are building a best-in-class ecosystem of tech tools uh, where, you, where you try to pick the number one from each category and now the challenge is making sure they all talk to, get, talk to each other nicely. Um, so that's actually six things. I'm not sure if I've had six things before. <laughs> but, Tom, that was absolutely fantastic. Um, Thank you very much. You, you guys at Signal seem to be really building a, a best-in-class cell operations function. We are definitely doing our best. So shout out to everybody else in the sales ops team at Signal, including Kirsty, um, who was a previous guest. So Tom, thank you so much for coming on. Thank you very much.